Neo was saying, welcome to the last module. You guys have made it this far at least. Um, so this module is on causal inference. So again, it's a little bit different from everything else we were talking about with our decision tree and like which analysis to use. This is going to be kind of touching on using some of the things that we have already covered in this course, which is why it's kind of a good endpoint to the course. Um, but why I particularly like causal inference is just because it gets us to think more critically about our data, think about like the direction of effects. Um, so like what is your exposure variable? What is your outcome variable? And then like what are the confounders um, that might be impacting the response that we observe when we have observational data that is. Um, so even if you aren't necessarily using causal inference um, statistical techniques, it's still really good to kind of think from the causal inference perspective when you're designing your study and also um, running your analyses and interpreting them at the end. So uh, with that being said, we're first going to go over everyone's favorite topic, which is causation versus correlation. Um, then we will be going over the potential outcomes framework followed by um, getting into the propensity score analysis, which is just one method of causal inference. Um, so we're going to define what propensity scores are when, and why we would use them, um, how to estimate them using some of the methods that we've already covered, and then how to actually use them in your analysis to estimate a causal treatment effect. So going back to our decision tree, as I said, we're not necessarily touching on going down a specific path of the decision tree, but I would say that if we were to choose a path, it would probably be back in this kind of estimation understanding path. Um, so initially, when we were doing our linear modeling um, yesterday morning, that was, we kind of assumed typically your data is going to be observational. I know some of you are in more medical fields, and for that reason, you will have experimental data, and that's fine. Um, but if you do have observational data, so you didn't randomly assign participants to a certain treatment group, that is, then when we are running these models, we just have to be very careful of the interpretation. Um, so that is why typically you'll see us say like that the estimated association is instead of things like the estimated effect of A on B. Because when the data is observational, we don't actually know that the predictors are affecting the outcome. Um, it could be the other way around or it could be something else entirely explaining that observed relationship that we see. And so in these situations where you do have observational data um, and you do want to determine whether there is a causal effect, so say there's a treatment of interest, um, it's just not fair to assign people to certain treatments and control groups. Uh, so you only have observational data to rely on, which is often the case, um, then you can use causal inference to get a better idea of that causal effect with your observational data. So again, an example would just be, let's say that we work in a hospital and there is a new cancer treatment um, that is said to reduce symptoms enough that somebody has a much better outcome and they're able to be discharged from the hospital is what this treatment is for. Um, so ideally, we would set up a randomized experiment where we randomly assign participants to the treatment group and others to the control group, and then that way we can fairly make a comparison between treatment and control. How often what happens typically in clinical studies is that some people need this treatment more than others, so we can't ethically justify withholding the treatment from some patients. Um, and so the issue becomes that what makes the individuals kind of more likely to receive treatment might also be impacting the outcome. Um, and so that is when we could use a causal inference approach. So getting into causation versus correlation, I know that we all are very aware that correlation does not equal causation. We all hear that all the time, um, but I'm just going to go over some kind of examples of that. So we're going to discuss the causal ladder today. And so what the causal ladder is, is you can kind of imagine walking up steps of what your true causation is. So at the bottom of the ladder, we have association and prediction. So in other words, you see something. So one way of thinking about this is if I see X, how does that change my belief in Y? So we might notice an association or a correlation between two uh, variables, but we don't necessarily know that changing X is causing a change in Y. We only can say that we think that Y will change with X. Then for uh, the next step up on the causal inference ladder is 
uh, step two, which is intervention. So that is when we're at now acting on the variables. So those would be our experimental designs. Um, so that is if I change X or if I change X by this much, how much does Y change? So then now I can actually like make that causal jump saying that the change in X is causing the change in Y. Then at the very top of the ladder is act different. So what that means is that, well, we know that assigning this treatment to this individual gave them a positive outcome, but what if I had told you that they would have had that same outcome had we not assigned them the treatment? So that is what we mean by act different, is if I change X in a different way, would I have seen the same response in Y. So is X actually the reason why Y changed? So we're gonna just go over quickly the bottom of the ladder, which is just our basic correlation analyses. Um, so that again is just what can we see between the variables? Um, and there are many limitations to correlation, which is why you probably heard in every statistics class that correlation does not equal causation. So the first thing that we can see is spurious correlations. So these ones are kind of fun. Um, just because you can get some fun spurious correlations, which just means there is a correlation between two variables that might be very strong, but there's no causal implication. So it just doesn't make sense how one of these variables could cause the other. Um, so there's like a whole website dedicated to this. Uh, so this one is the number of people who drown by falling, falling into a pool correlates highly with the number of films that Nicolas Cage has appeared in. So naturally, I don't know about you guys, um, maybe you can't think of some real causal effect here, um, but it could just be that there are enough confounders between these two variables that um, that is explaining this relationship. And then just another fun one is the divorce rate in Maine correlates with the per capita consumption of margarine. And you can see that one's a very strong correlation at 0.99. Um, so no matter how strong your correlation is, it does not imply causation clearly. Then we have Simpson's paradox. So that's just that um, if we look at data one way and then we look at it another way, we can end up with very contradictory findings. So if we were to look at this plot here, where let's say along the X axis, we have the dose of an experimental treatment. And then on the Y axis, we have the risk of heart disease. <clears throat> then it looks like as we increase the dose of the experimental treatment, the risk of heart disease is going up. So we might say, okay, that's not a good treatment. But what if I told you that all these points up in the top corner here are males and they were more likely to receive the treatment because they had a higher risk of heart disease, whereas females didn't receive equally high doses just because they simply had a lower risk of heart disease. And so you can see that now when we separate it into males and females and look at the relationship separately, for each of those, um, so looking at just females, for instance, you can see that as we increase the dose for females, their risk of heart disease goes down. And similarly for males, as we increase the dose for males, their risk of heart disease goes down. So that's just showing the importance of kind of um, thinking about all the different confounders that you could have that could explain both their assignment to the treatment group and then also um, their outcome. And then finally, with correlation, the issue is that we have symmetry. So that just means that if I see an association, I don't know if it's X causing Y or Y causing X. Um, so let's say the classic smoking causes lung cancer example. So if I were to just look at observational data of this, then I could set up my linear model saying, okay, I'm gonna predict lung cancer with smoking. So I just have my standard linear model with lung cancer as my Y and smoking as my X. Now, the issue with that is in observational data, I could equally just go like this and say, okay, so I'm going to predict smoking given lung cancer. And we don't know which way the relationship goes. Maybe lung cancer causes smoking. I mean, it doesn't sound right, but you, you just can't be sure. And so overall, the limitations of correlation would be that we just need to account for confounding variables in order to really be sure of whether X causes Y or if it is something else that is explaining that relationship. And so that is why we end up with that correlation is not causation. And so let's start off with what is causation then? So we're gonna define causation as that when all variables are adjusted for, a change in X implies a change in Y, 
but a change in y does not necessarily result in a change in x. Such as means that assuming all else is equal across individuals, if I have individuals who smoke and individuals who do not, then I would say that if smoking increases the likelihood of lung cancer, then smoking does seem to cause lung cancer. Um, but those with lung cancer might not be, or those with lung cancer might not be more likely to smoke. So that is how we are going to define causation. So that brings us to the next step on the causal ladder, which many of you are likely very familiar with, which is our experimental designs. So that's the intervention. So there's different types of intervention analyses that we can do. We have the randomized control experiment or RCTs. So these are often the gold standard that we all aim for in our um, experiments where we are going to randomly assign individuals to the treatment groups um, and everything else. We can just assume that because we randomly sample from the population and then randomly assign to treatment groups that those individuals are somewhat equal. So if there's differences in other variables between these individuals, it kind of all balances out um, as we randomize them. And so that is what we typically rely on for de deciding whether um, there is a causal relationship between variables. Then we have our crossover experiments, which in theory is very good, but kind of difficult to achieve. Um, so the crossover experiment would be like at time one, we're going to assign treatment one to all the individuals then at time two, we're going to assign the other treatment to the same individuals, because that really reduces the confounding if we can say, OK, so for this individual, treatment A did this and treatment B did this. And then that's a fair comparison between treatment A and B. Um, but you have to kind of meet very strict conditions for that to be the case, uh, primarily that whatever treatment you do assign at time one does not impact their outcome at time two. Um, so often it can be kind of difficult to fully determine whether um, the treatment at time one might have changed the effect of the treatment assigned at time two and vice versa. And then we have conditional randomization. So this goes back to the experimental treatment um, example that I was talking about, where sometimes, uh, for whatever reason, certain individuals might be more likely to be assigned to the treatment group. Um, and so a classic case would just be that if someone's cancer is more severe and we think that this treatment, experimental treatment might really help them, um, then they might have a higher probability of being assigned to the treatment group solely based on their cancer severity level. And so we're going to focus more on the conditional randomization, um, just because this is kind of what the propensity scores are going to be based off of. So let's say this is my sample here of blue and dark blue and light blue dots. Um, so let's say that I am going to randomly assign dots such that we have a higher probability of being assigned the treatment. So we're going to denote treatment as capital A. So you're going to have a higher probability of being assigned the treatment if you're in the light blue group than the dark blue group. So I go ahead and I conduct my experiment to end up with my final results. And so then I end up here. So let's say that the light circles, they had a 56% probability of treatment. And then the dark circles had a 40% probability of treatment. So in the end, these are what my two treatment groups look like. This one's my treatment group. This one's my control. And I want to make a comparison in order to determine whether the treatment has a good or positive or negative effect on the outcome of interest. But you can see that I cannot just go ahead and directly compare these two groups as if we're just looking at them, those don't look like they are both representative of one another. So in this one, obviously, we clearly have more light, light colored circles. In this one, we have more dark colored circles. Um, and so because of that, uh, we cannot fairly determine whether it is the treatment causing the change in outcome or whether it might be the color of circle causing the change in outcome. So with conditional randomization, if we know what the variables are that we randomize based on, then we can simply just stratify our sample based on those variables and then make our comparisons. So what I mean by that is that we're just going to compare the treatment group to the control group for those in the light circle group. And then we're going to do the same for those in the dark circle group. And then based on those results, I can summarize them and say that um, take like a weighted mean or something of our treatment effect between the two groups. And then we would say that is equal to 
a completely randomized experiment once we condition on that covariate. And so that leads us to the potential outcomes framework. Um, so now, now we're getting into the act different or the top of our causal ladder. So consider the following scenarios. So let's say that there is a new antidepressant drug and I want to know about the effect on certain side effects of, for the individual. So let's say that if I assign an individual this antidepressant drug, they end up feeling bad because they have all these side effects. Um, then I might be inclined to say that, okay, well, this antidepressant clearly causes these side effects. But what if I had told you that if I didn't assign them the antidepressant, they would have been happy? Then I can now say for sure that, okay, well, there's nothing else different between these two situations other than in one I assigned the antidepressant and the other I didn't. And so because of that, I would say that the antidepressant does not, or does, sorry, cause side effects. Then in scenario two, let's say that I assign the antidepressant, I give it to the individual and they feel bad. So it's looking like it would cause side effects. But if I were to, in hindsight, know that if I didn't give them the antidepressant, they would have felt just as bad, then clearly there's something else going on. So it's not necessarily due to the antidepressant. So this kind of shows the importance of the act different step of causation. So can it truly be explained due to that one variable or is there something else going on that we're missing? And so this is kind of the more statistical definition of causation, where is a treatment exposure has a causal effect on the outcome for individual I if their potential outcomes are not equal. So what that means is that their outcome Y of zero would be the outcome if they were not assigned the treatment is not equal to their outcome if they were assigned the treatment. And we're just looking at binary treatments right now. So if we can conclusively say that those two outcomes are different for individuals, then we know that it has a causal effect. So then we're looking at the average causal treatment effect. So let's just say that for each of these individuals in the table, I knew what their outcome would be had they been assigned the treatment and had they not been assigned the treatment. So this first column here is if they were in the control group and the second column here is if they were in the treatment group. So then I can go ahead and do my analysis where I can just calculate the expected value of column one, which is if they were in the control group and compare it to the expected value or the mean of column two, which is if they're in the treatment group. Then comparing those, I can then determine whether there is an average causal effect, we call it. So that would just be the mean of the causal effect under the control, and then the mean of the outcome under the treatment. And then if those are the same, then we do not have a causal effect. So the causal effect is zero in this example. And then we can see that, that makes sense based on kind of looking at the individual causal effects. So just what would happen to this first individual here had they been assigned the control, they would have an outcome of zero. Had they been assigned the treatment, they would have an outcome of one. And so then that looks like a negative treatment effect. And then here we have uh, that their outcome would not change. So both are zero under the control and under the treatment. So there is no causal effect for that individual. Whereas down here, we have some individuals that have the positive effect. And so then you can kind of see that it would balance out to be about zero across all individuals. Um, and so that kind of gives us the, the relationship between causation and association. So in association, we would have our population of interest where some are treated, some are untreated. And then we could simply split that up into just comparing the treated group versus the untreated group and seeing whether they differ from one another. But that would only give us the correlation between that variable and the outcome. Whereas ideally we could instead take our population of interest and then complete these triangles. So we'll take the treated and then we want to know what would have happened if we had treated the untreated and add that over here. And then similarly, we wanna know what happened if we had given the control to the treated group. And then if we could compare those full diamonds, then that gives us causation. But the issue is obviously that we cannot determine um, basically, obviously everyone's potential outcome. Uh, so it is very difficult to know for sure what would have happened if the individual had been assigned to another treatment group. 
Um, so let's go over an example scenario quickly. Let's say that we have two women and they both um, signed up for a 12 step program for Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, we want to know how effective that program is on abstinence as our outcome. Um, and so if I were to tell you that maybe it succeeded for the woman on the left and not the woman on the right, or sorry, succeeded for the woman on the right, not for the woman on the left, um, and then we can kind of compare their covariates. So let's say that the woman on the left, she has a job that she has to go back to and they're funding her to do the program. The woman on the right has a newborn baby. The woman on the left does not have children. Uh, the woman on the left does drink more alcohol daily than the woman on the right. Uh, they both suffer from depression. And so what we can do is we can calculate the probability of receiving their treatment, the 12 step program, given the measured covariates. Let's just say that based on those covariates, we would assign the woman on the left had a pretty low probability of entering the 12 step program. So she only had a 5% chance, whereas the woman on the right had a 50% chance. So quite a bit higher of entering the 12 step program. So based on that, I cannot fairly compare their actual outcomes and say whether it is due to the fact that they participated in the 12 step program. So if the woman on the right did have a, a better outcome, let's say that she was more abstinent than the woman on the left, it could just be due to any of these covariates that differed between the two women um, that made this one more likely to even enter into the program in the first place than the woman on the left. Um, so you can see the importance of kind of accounting for all of these covariates in our models. And so we can do that with the propensity score by including these probabilities. So we'll simply measure the probability of receiving the treatment based on all of the confounders that we think are of interest. And we can incorporate those into our model to make sure that it is accounted for uh, before estimating the causal effect. So in order to do that, we do need to make some pretty uh, strict assumptions based on propensity scores. I want to say that for each of these assumptions, keep in mind that there are more complex statistical methods that kind of address what happens if these are violated, which we're not going to go over today. But just know that there are things that you can do um, if these assumptions are not met for any reason. So once we account or condition on the propensity scores, what we're saying is that we can then treat an observational study as a conditionally randomized experiment, which means that we can determine if there is a causal effect of the exposure on the outcome if the following assumptions are met. So the first one is consistency. So that is just that the treatment is consistently defined across individuals. So the example that I like to give to this one is uh, the COVID vaccine. So if I were to look at the impact of the COVID vaccine on COVID symptoms uh, six months down the line, then I would have to make sure that I'm looking at a very specific vaccine, because as we all know, it might be different between Pfizer and Moderna. Um, and so that would impact the causal effect of just the vaccine category. I might want to split it up instead into Pfizer versus Moderna to make sure that I'm uh, consistently defining that treatment variable for all individuals. Then we have exchangeability. Um, so another way to think of this is that there's no unmeasured confounding. So that means that any possible confounder that might be making individuals more or less likely to be assigned to the treatment group um, and that might impact the outcome is measured and accounted for in your propensity score model. Um, and so what that what exchangeability specifically means is that we would expect that if we were to swap the groups after accounting for the propensity score. So what I mean by swap the groups is that if we were to assign the treatment to the control group and then assign control to the treatment group, that we would get the exact same conclusions at the end of the day. So the groups are exchangeable, um, which should be true if we have accounted for all of the confounding. Then we have the positivity assumption. And so what that just means is that um, each individual has at least some possibility of being assigned to the treatment or the control. So we have no all zero or all one propensity scores. Um, they're all somewhere bounded between zero and one. And then finally, we have stable unit treatment value, which just means that um, one individual's treatment does not impact another individual's outcome. 
So again, with the COVID example, clearly something like vaccines might need a different statistical method in order to determine causation, uh, just because if enough individuals in the population have been vaccinated against a disease, then it is less likely for others to catch it as well. So that would violate the stable unit treatment value assumption. So getting into calculating propensity scores, you're all very well equipped to do it now. Um, so we have some parametric approaches, which are just our standard linear models, such as logistic regression, which we have covered. We didn't go over probate regression and linear discriminant analysis, but those are just some other options you can use. Then we have our machine learning approaches. So Patrick did cover random forest, key nearest neighbors, um, things like that that we can use, or even penalized uh, regression or regularized regression. And so which covariates to include in your propensity score model? There's a bit of a lack of consensus in the literature. Um, so I'd say it's up to you, really. Um, so some argue to only include covariates related to the treatment. Some argue to include all measured baseline covariates that you have available to you. And then others argue to include all covariates really related to the treatment and the outcome. Um, so again, it's really up to you. I think that the first argument is just coming from the fact that the beauty of propensity scores is that we don't at all have to look at our outcome variable while we're fitting the propensity score models. So you can't kind of bias your results at all in that sense. Um, and then whereas with the third argument, we would obviously have to look at the outcome of it before getting to our final model. Um, and so it's really up to you on what you do there, as long as you're just transparent in your um, write-up of your results. And so the one important thing to remember is that it is important to only include covariates measured prior to the treatment, because we only want to consider the covariates that would um, change your likelihood of treatment. So we don't actually want to, we don't care about the covariates necessarily, that might be an outcome of the treatment, if that makes sense. And so then let's get into how do, can we account for propensity scores? So once we fit our logistic regression or random forest, we can predict the probability of treatment for each individual. And then now what do we do with those? So there's a few different options. The first one is stratification. So ideally what we could do is find two individuals with the same exact propensity score. Um, one individual is treated, one individual is not, and then we can compare their outcomes because then we could assume that since they have the exact same propensity score, they have all the same covariates. Um, however, that isn't really that realistic because propensity scores are continuous and range from zero to one. So there are really an infinite number of possibilities of propensity scores in there. Um, so instead, what we can do is we can divide them into smaller groups. So we're going to know our propensity score here as pi of x, just meaning that the probability of treatment given our covariates in x. So let's say that this here is our sample. The stars are going to be those that were assigned to the treatment group, and the circles are those that were assigned to the control group. And so what we can do is we can uh, calculate the propensity scores for all these individuals, then put them in two groups. So we have those with the propensity score of less than 0.25, for example. Um, propensity scores between 0.25 and 0.5, and then all the way up to propensity scores greater than 0.75. So then we can assume that within each of these strata, we have a balanced sample, um, meaning that we can just treat it as a random sample. So looking at this first strata here, what we can now do is we have our stars, which were our treated group, and then we have our circles, which were our control group. And so for each of those now, we can calculate the, um, the outcome variable. So let's say that our expected outcome was 0.66. So two of the individuals had the disease of the three. Whereas in the treated group, let's say only one of the two individuals had the disease. So you can see that there is a difference there. It does look like maybe this treatment does work because we have a lower probability of disease in the treated group then in the control, and we're assuming that we accounted for all the confounding. Um, so alternatively, after setting up the strata, we can simply just build a linear regression model. Um, so the regression model would have our treatment variable and also our propensity score strata as a dummy variable. Um, and some people will also include an interaction between the propensity score strata and the treatment if you do think that each strata might have a different treatment effect. 
So another thing to consider is that we could argue that we could just go ahead then and put the propensity score directly into our model without dividing it into strata first. Um, however, the issue with that is that it's not recommended just because it is sensitive that way to the relationship between the propensity score and the outcome. Um, so if we kind of just assume that that's going to be a linear relationship, so we just throw it into our linear regression model, um, then misspecification of that relationship can bias the results. Um, and it also just lets you play around with it a little bit too much if you try fixing it up. Uh, so it's just not the recommended approach. The next approach is called matching. Um, some might argue that instead of calculating the average causal effect in the entire population, this one is more focused on calculating the effect among the treated, because you'll see that we end up throwing out observations. Um, so what matching means is that for each treated individual, we're going to find one or more untreated individuals with similar propensity scores. And there's different ways that you can go about this matching. Um, and so you can also use it with or without replacement. So each time we match someone, we can then um, rematch the control with some other treatment if uh, need be, would be the with replacement or that control is then confined to that single treatment and we cannot use it again, would be without replacement. Um, so again, this closely resembles the average causal effect among the treated because we end up throwing out controls. So we can't really consider it our initial population anymore. So let's go over greedy matching with nearest neighbor. So what I mean by greedy is that we just start at the top. So again, the stars are our treated and then the controls are our circles here. I have their propensity score calculated for each of them. And so if I were to just randomly assign these an order here, um, then I start at the top and then I just choose the control observation with the closest propensity score, and then I go down. So to show you how that works, this treated observation has a propensity score of 0.95. And so if I look through this list here, it looks like this control observation with the propensity score of 0.85 would be the closest. So we're gonna match those two individuals then I go to the next and we see that I can assign this 0.6 with the control observation of 0.62. Then I have 0.75 with 0.7. And then now finally we get to the last observation, which is 0.8. So although 0.8 would be technically closest to this control individual here, if we're doing the matching without replacement, then this individual is already tied to this one. So we can't use it again. So that means that this one then has to go to the next best option among the available options, which would be the propensity score of 0.55. And then, yeah, and then I throw out um, the remaining control so that I have the balanced sample between the treated and the control. Um, so again, that is why some might argue that we are estimating the average causal effect among the treated because we're disregarding some of the controls. And then we also set up a caliper, it's called. So that just means that in order to match individuals, um, they have to be have propensity scores within that threshold of each other. Um, so for example, with a caliper of 0 0.05, um, I cannot assign the first observation to any because there are no other uh, propensity scores in the control condition with a close enough propensity score. Going down to the 0.6, the 0.62 falls within that 0 0.05 range, so we're okay. The 0.75 is within 0 0.05 of 0.7. And then now this 0.8 can be assigned to this control of 0.85 because we're just going to throw out that first observation there. And then we just end up with an even smaller sample. And then finally, the other way to account for propensity scores is to do inverse probability treatment weighting. Um, and so it's similar to methods that you might see used in survey sampling, if any of you are familiar with it. But basically, we're going to assign individuals weights based on the inverse of their propensity score. So the idea here is that these are what the, the formula for the weights are. So you can imagine with a binary treatment A, you can see that we'll have that the individuals in the treated group end up with one over their propensity score as their weight. And then the individuals in the control group end up with one over um, one minus the propensity score as their weight. And so the way to think about this is that 
if an individual is in the treated group and they have a very small propensity score, meaning a very small probability of treatment, then they're going to be weighted more heavily um, than individuals in the treated group that had a high probability of receiving the treatment. And then same for the controls. And so once we have that weighted treatment, then there's different estimators we can use, or you can do a weighted linear regression model. Um, but the simplest would just be to look at the mean outcome in our weighted sample. Um, so we're going to do the mean outcome of the treated minus the mean outcome of the control once we account for the inverse of their propensity scores. And then that would be our causal effect. And so which method to use? There's no really cut and dry, clear answer. Um, so the issue is that the inverse propensity score weighting and covariate adjustment are more sensitive to the accuracy of the propensity score estimation because of how directly they're kind of using that propensity score in the model. Um, so we can't necessarily say that our propensity score methods are perfect. Um, and so those ones will be a bit more sensitive if our propensity score methods are not completely accurate in predicting the probability of treatment. Um, then we have that stratification might lead to increased bias simply just because we are dividing them randomly into strata and we don't know for sure whether those strata are going to be more or less similar to one another. Um, matching, we're throwing out samples, so you're making the sample size smaller. Um, which can be particularly problematic if you already have a small sample. And then also, it really only lets us estimate the average effect among the treated rather than in the population. Um, but there are some good papers here that uh, do review all of this. Um, so what I tend to do is just kind of like use all the approaches for the propensity score analysis. And then there is ways that you can evaluate how well um, those propensity scores are working for your data. And so I kind of like to do that. And then whichever one ends up with the most balanced or representative samples at the end, then that's the one that you can kind of just go ahead and use. So for checking balance, we want to make sure that the distribution of our confounders are the same among the treated and the untreated. Um, so initially, if we assume that we have observational data where some individuals might be more likely to be assigned to the treated group, then we know that in our initial sample, at least, a lot of those confounders are not going to have equal distributions between the treated and the untreated. So what we can do is we can check the balance of these covariates before our propensity score adjustment, and then check it again after our propensity score adjustment to see how um, adjusting for those propensity scores fix the balance, hopefully. Um, and so the method for checking balance depends on the method used for accounting for propensity scores, but they're pretty similar. So what I mean by balance is we're just going to be measuring the effect size for the difference uh, between the two groups for each covariate. So we don't rely on significance um, when we're looking at the difference in a covariate between two groups here, just because significance is highly uh, reliant on your sample size. And so it could be that you're getting that there is absolutely no balance just because you have too large of a sample. Um, or you might end up, if you have a small sample, you might think that there is more balance than there actually is. So you'll often see people rely on the standardized mean difference instead, which is just our effect size. So for each covariate, I'm going to go through and I'm going to compare it between the treated group and the control group. So with a continuous covariate, I'm just going to be finding the mean difference between my treated and my control group for that covariate. And then I can divide that by the pooled um, standard deviation, which is that formula there. For dichotomous covariate, it's a similar idea, but now we're just going to be comparing the proportion of that covariate in the treated group to the proportion in the control group. And then we set some threshold. The um, commonly speci specified value would be 0.1. So once we have this um, difference calculated for each covariate, if this D value is greater than 0.1, then we would say that that covariate is not balanced between the treated and control groups. And if D is less than 0.1, then we can say it is balanced, which is what we want. Um, another thing that you can do is just visualize the distributions between the two groups using um, some plots, such as box plots and histograms. And then, um, so sorry, in the match sample and strata, what we would do is in our match sample or within each individual strata, we're going to be looking at the balance between the treatment group and the control group using these formulas. 
Whereas in our weighted sample, we're going to be doing the same thing. Um, but now rather than like looking at it just in specific subsets of our data, we're looking at it in the full weighted data set. And so we're going to be going over in R where there are methods and packages that can do this for us, which is great. And then so for the steps of your analysis, just because why not make another decision tree? Um, we're going to first estimate our propensity scores. Then you can see are the samples balanced. So just meaning across all covariates, are they roughly equal between the treatment and control groups? If yes, then we can go ahead and estimate our treatment effect. And if no, then we're going to try again. So what that means is we might go fix up our propensity score model. Maybe we need to transform some of the variables. Maybe we need to add some interactions. Um, if we use a logistic regression, let's say, we can fit a random force instead and see if that helps. Um, so you can kind of just keep playing around with it until you do get more balance in your sample. And so finally, why use propensity scores? Um, so you might be thinking, well, you might have learned that regression analysis, if we throw our confounders into the model, then when we're estimating the treatment effect, we are accounting for those confounders. And you're absolutely right. Um, that is the case. But the issue is um, that propensity scores, we can fit more confounders because regression is often limited to our sample size. Um, whereas with propensity score, we can easily use um, machine learning methods to throw all possible confounders in and predict that probability. Um, with propensity scores, like I was saying earlier, we also don't look at the outcome variable until we have our propensity scores um, estimated and make sure that everything is balanced and then we go and fit our outcome model. Um, so there's just like less chance for p hacking in that case, whereas with regression, maybe you'll exclude some covariates or I don't know what people might do, but they can make enough changes to their model until they get the treatment effect that they were hoping for. Um, and then another sample size issue just with regression is that um, if we have like a rare outcome, then regression is a little bit more sensitive to picking up on that, um, especially with smaller samples. Um, whereas propensity scores can kind of help us reduce like the number of covariates in that outcome model compared to our sample size. And so with that, we can get into the module six lab.